ओके सो सो नेक्स्ट ट्वेंटी फाइव मिनट्स होपफुली नॉट लॉन्गर देन दैट आई टॉक अबाउट व्हाट इज लाइफ थ्रेटनिंग हेमरेज एंड मैसिव ट्रांसफ्यूजन सो वील डिफाइन द प्रॉब्लम एंड whether we can predict massive transfusion what is acute coagulopathy of trauma and i want to spend some time on these two new concepts short and side okay and uh, then we'll talk about cold stored whole blood versus uh, fixed ratio transfusion versus uh, viscoelastic guided transfusion and then what we should do at the bed so so i just put this up just to say that uh, we we can at presentation if the patient comes to us in ed or if the patient directly comes to the icu if the patient has got class 4 hemorrhage the atls says that you should use crystalloids and blood for replacement i am not going to talk about what is class 2 class 3 etc i just want you to remember that this is probably wrong okay if you look at the results you should probably not use crystalloids for resuscitation in these patients at all okay so previously we used to say when i was a resident that massive transfusion is more than 10 uh, prbcs in 24 hours uh, the modern definition has changed so apart from this 10 prbcs now it is more than 4 pack red blood cells in 1 hour or loss of more than 50% volume in 3 hours uh you call it call the patient that the patient has substantial bleeding when the packed blood cells uh, are required within 2 hours or more than 5 erbcs or bleeding related death occurs within 4 hours so in trauma the deaths will be uh, within first 24 hours or late deaths Okay, so first 24 hour deaths are generally because of exsanguination. The late deaths are because of uh, multi-organ failure. The usual deaths because of prolonged ICU stay. Uh, critical administration positive is more than uh, three packed red blood cells. So uh, CAT 24 hours is So this has to happen within any one hour of the 24 hours of arrival. So CAT one hour is within the first hour of arrival, and four hour is again within one hour after four hours of arrival in the ED or the ICU. So anticipation is the name of the game when we are talking about resuscitating this patient. particularly if you have to prevent the early deaths and of course there is hypoperfusion and there is secondary uh, traumatic brain injury if you delay the uh, resuscitation therefore you want to predict massive transfusion in trauma now i am not sure this is available for free but i am sure you can find ways to get this i think if you are examining you should read this Okay, so there are multiple scores described. I am not just going to talk about three or four. So the first one, which I am not going to talk about, is the clinical gestalt, which essentially means that they ask the clinician, "Do you think the patient needs blood? Uh, is going to need massive transfusion or not?" Because if the clinician felt yes, then he is going to activate the massive transfusion protocol, and it is not very good. So the predictive value was, I think, something around. 55 or 60 percent area under the ratio of operating power. Okay, so the ABC score is the score which can be done fastest. It has only four criteria. The only thing that is subjective in this is the fast or E fast now that you do it, and maximum four points. So if the score is more than two, then the area under the curve is. 0.85 for prediction of passive transfusion, and it is useful because it does not rely on any lab values and no calculations are required. Then the TAS score has uh, seven variables, but you can see there is hemoglobin etc. etc. included in this. 
So in the original study at a cut off of TAS score of more than 60, patients had 50% chance of needing muscle transfusion and the area under the receiver operating curve was 0.86. So anything above 0.8 is reasonable. Uh, so again in this score there are lab parameters and therefore it's not great. The emergency transfusion score uh, has a very good negative predictive value uh, but it predicts only need for transfusion. It was developed for not for predictive muscle transfusion and it cannot tell you about the penetrating injury. So only talks about the blood injury. Last is the Prince of Wales score, customer score uh, and each uh, uh, each variable is given different scores. Again, uh, area under the curve is very good, but you will need a ABG and a hemoglobin value unless you substitute the base deficit value and the hemoglobin value from a blood gas analysis. There are lots of other scores, but essentially you should use some score to predict need for muscle transfusion apart from what you feel. Uh, because what you feel may not be accurate enough in treating this patient. So, uh, there are lots of scores and if you read that article, you will get these scores there. And all the ones which, which I have put in uh, squares are things which need some kind of lab investigation. So, when you are in a hurry, you don't want to wait or don't want to get distracted by these uh, lab values to come and calculate the score. Some of the scores need complex calculations. You don't want that when you are dealing with such situations. Okay. Coming to acute coagulopathy of trauma, uh, the reason I said in the beginning that you should not probably use crystalloids is if you look at this, and this study is pretty old, 2007, uh, so the study might must have been even earlier. So the injurious severity score when they looked at the mortality as per the uh, ISS and presence of coagulopathy on admission out of 10,000 patients, nearly 35% patients were coagulopathy. So in US and other places, from pre-hospital to hospital admission and military uh, circumstances, you are used to fresh present plasma for research station and they don't use crystals. So previously people used to use normal saline for resuscitation. So if the incidence is this high, most of the coagulopathy is because of hypofibrinemia, then you should probably not use crystal. So uh, that's a fallacy in the ATLS score unless they have changed it in the 10th uh, uh, edition. Okay, so we know the lethal triad is coagulopathy, acidosis and hypothermia and they all perpetuate each other. So the patients get injured, uh, they bleed and they are hypoperfuse, therefore leading to acidosis. Since they are exposed and there is no active warming, they get hypothermia and hemorrhage itself can cause coagulopathy and it's a vicious triad. So you will get base deficit before actually hypotension is seen in the patient. So patient blood pressure might be normal, but then there are n number of studies of base deficits and lactate, which suggests that occult hypoperfusion may be present in presence of normal blood pressure. Okay, so if the base deficit is more than 6, then patients are likely to require early transfusion, uh, increased length of stay, increased mortality, and therefore, and increased risk of ARDS and multi organ failure. Um, so, acidosis is one thing which contributes more to coagulopathy than hypothermia, and it is not reversible. If the patient becomes hypothermic, the mortality is going to be higher because the coagulation cascade stops working below 92 degrees. So, uh, the enzymatic pathway degrades. Then that is the fallacy with the conventional test that you are actually doing the test at 37 degrees when the patient's temperature is 34 or 33 and the coagulation cascade may not be working well. 
so you need to prevent and treat uh, hypothermia with warm blood products and iv fluids and again take iv fluids with a pinch of salt try to use blood products or ffp use force warming devices and recently we have renewed this for our departmental purpose and actually force air warming devices don't work so once you induce anesthesia the it doesn't work the okay, once the patient becomes uh, cold it's not going to heating mattresses may be more effective uh, and the other advantage is that if you are going to do a damage control surgery in these patients then they will not restrict the uh, surgical access now i'm going to spend a little more time this is going to take some time to understand i want you to read this okay uh because this is a uh, free download okay so this is the classic coagulopathy uh, that we talk about so shock causing oxygen deficiency hypoperfusion uh, physiologic dilation etc etc tissue injury inflammation and sympathetic adrenal and neurohumeral activation then it divides into regular fibrinolysis uh shine which is shock induced uh, endothelopathy which is so all these three factors the first three factors act on the x factor that we don't know about why the patients die plus age and gender and this leads to shine which is activation of endogenous uh, uh, anticoagulation which prevents the blood from clotting and that leads to primary or endogenous acute traumatic coagulopathy okay the uh, rarely you will get what is called as a shutdown fibrinolysis which will occur in patients with liver transplant sepsis and maybe other situation which we don't know about fortunately uh, about 20% patients will have regular fibrinolysis mortality is 44% acute traumatic traumatic coagulopathy if you treat it early is most common but the mortality is, can be reduced to 17% and uh, shutdown fibrinolysis may occur only in about 20% of patient and mortality is 3% so as secondary events so continuing from the previous slide you have this triad that we talked about the lethal triad so this secondary event leads to the secondary coagulopathy of trauma which is the resuscitation associated or atrogenic coagulopathy now if we want to prevent this i suggest that we prevent the dilution by giving ffp rather than giving resloids and the final event is either death or pro thrombotic coagulopathy that is the late coagulopathy of trauma which is part of the shutdown fibrinolysis so the fibrinolysis just stops okay now this article is free for download and i think this is an excellent overview starts from uh, it talks about many things which we are not reading anymore okay for example this is an article which i found recently when i was reading about this just published in uh, 1930 so more than 100 years ago and he, this gentleman said that uh, the anesthesia is not enough so ether your seat of of ether of course uh, and he says what we need is anoc association essentially if if you do general anesthesia without giving a regional anesthesia for example the impulses will still reach the brain and the hypothesis behind the kinetic therapy is that uh, the brain never sleeps okay you think the patient is anesthetized but the brain is active and it is traumatized by events what is happening so you have trauma which is uh, damaged the brain and we will come to that in a minute plus the surgic surgery itself that traumatic additional traumatic insult will cause further harm to the blood brain barrier and etc 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 and we we'll go on to the short and the shine in a minute 
so traumatic impulses are not excluded by ether anesthesia from that part of the brain that is apparently asleep so it's actually not asleep so according to cry and many others in that period up to 1960s is uh, brain is the controller of all things and many people seem to be thinking now and this has been going on for last 7 or 8 years that we are too much into reductionism okay reductionism in the sense that we take a physiological phenomenon we try to explain that a disease why why this has happened hypotension has happened lack like has gone up base deficit has occurred etc etc and then we treat that so we treat discrete events with discrete interventions where there are multiple things happening and we go to that the patient as a patient as a whole in a holistic manner so the question is that we still get early deaths and we still get late deaths and we don't know why so it's a potentially preventable cause of mortality and patient's physiological status looks okay but the patient's still die so this paper this this hypothesis as one of the major hypothesis why the patients uh, still die after so many advances so this was said in 1923 by someone else so essentially it says that the patient's nervous system is not only disturbed by the original trauma but also by the surgical procedure incidental to operation now we have partly changed this in the sense that we have started doing damage control surgery instead of repairing everything right so we have reduced that insert and maybe that's why the outcomes are improved somewhat okay so system hypothesis of trauma or shock has three pillars it says that there is cns and cardiovascular coupling endothelial glycocalyx strength and mitochondrial integrity Okay. Nobody is going to ask you this in the examination, but this is probably the future, and this is what we will probably do in next 20 or 25 years. So, neural circuit, parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system, heart rate variability, which is a normal thing. Okay, so someone loses heart rate variability, it's a problem. Catecholamines, neuromodulatory factors, and baroreceptors, etc. Et 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 et. So. and this is coming into hemodynamic monitoring as well now so there is ventricular arterial coupling and normally this ratio arterial elasticity versus divided by lv elasticity should be one okay when there is a change in this ratio uh, then the cardiac pump becomes inefficient and they quote several studies the authors quote several studies where in trauma patients without apparent cardiac trauma the patient's cardiac function has reduced Okay, so they say that if when you do give vasodilators to patients with heart failure, uh, then it reduces the artery elasticity and reduces the ratio towards one. Also, when you add vasodilators, it improves or iodilators, sorry, it improves the ventricular elasticity and that's why again the uh, VA coupling improves towards one or ES divided by Uh, e E S, so it should have been E A. So artery elasticity divided by the ventricular elasticity towards one. The second thing, and we are realizing this over last 20 years or so, is that the endothelial glycocalyx is a very very important thing. And if you read the article, it talks about how much is the surface area. So endothelial uh, glycocalyx apparently is like 2000. Uh, U.S. football fields, the area is that much. So it's a key player in ventricular arterial coupling. And when the when there is trauma, it leads to what is called as endothelial cavity of trauma. So it follows any major trauma or surgery. Uh, for because of multiple factors, it leads to shedding of glycocalyx. It gets detached from the basement membrane to which it is. and uh, it is activated by the uh, reactive oxygen species etc and 
ultimately it leads to damage to the blood brain barrier there are several diagrams which were too complex to produce in a single slide there so i will try to attempt to reproduce them what we need to remember again is the last line so uh early treatment of hypoperfusion so pre hospital treatment in trauma patient is ex becomes extremely important uh because it can restore the endothelial glycocalyx which will prevent this secondary cascade of events which will lead to the late deaths and the third is mitochondrial terminal integrity there is nothing new in this uh in the sense that mitochondria produce the atp and hypoperfusion reduces the atp production etc etc and it can be only sustained transiently when you switch to anaerobic metabolism this is the usual thing the first two things are important the other hypothesis why you have early and late death particularly the late death is called uh, shock induced endotheliopathy or shine and unlike the previous theory they say it is given by sympathetic adrenal hyperactivation so when the patient have a uh, severe trauma they will produce endothelial responses and depending on their phenotype they will have different responses which is most probably driven by their genetic component and the last thing i will talk about is the trauma induced immunosuppression which is again uh, so if you have uh, exsanguination you will get early death and then you go to secondary complications so there is system failure from cns to mitochondria immune cell dysregulation cytokine production uh, increased susceptibility to infection called because of what is called as pics or persistent inflammation immunosuppression and catabolism syndrome which leads to uh, late deaths in trauma patients okay coming to more mundane matters uh, we'll talk about which should we use so fixed ratio versus cold stored whole blood uh, or viscoelasticity elasticity guided transfusion unfortunately there is not too much time so we i am sure you all of you are familiar with this from study and proper study we essentially did not show too much advantage of giving fixed ratio uh, transfusion uh, but early deaths could be prevented because you prevented exsanguination okay and if you so again i am suggesting that if you start resuscitating with uh fft or cryo precipitate whatever is available to you at the earliest before the coagulopathy develops and you correct that then again deaths due to exsanguination can be prevented now this is a review which looked at both civilian and military uh, trauma and you can see i just highlighted those which studies which are positive so whole blood transfusion versus uh, blood component transfusion so only two studies here show a difference okay uh, and if you read the paper in detail then they talk about Uh, pre-hospital resuscitation again involving FFPs, where the uh, uh, sorry, not FFP, whole blood. So they suggest that it seems to suggest that in the pre-hospital period, if you give fresh blood or whole blood, cold stored whole blood, the outcomes might be different. This is for the uh, military. Uh, sorry, that is for 24 hours. This is for 30 hours, and again. the same two studies for civilian casualties are uh, positive rest are negative and uh, then there are 14 military studies which they talk about where uh, the mortality was lower when whole blood was given in 6 out of 14 studies so essentially they could not draw uh, uh, they say that they have demonstrated superiority the problem is the variable statistical significance so if you look at the studies separately there is uh, p values are all over the place there is lot of heterogeneity about when the blood was given 
and how it was used, etc., etc. All we we know is that the whole blood transfusion or fixed transfusion both are safe. Uh, if and this is the point which will probably uh, come to fore in in near future or next ten or twenty years is that if you do trauma resuscitation with whole blood in the field before the patient reaches the hospital, it will probably improve survivals. And this is the latest study which was published last year, which actually showed a very very huge difference uh, when whole blood was used. Okay, so as, as compared to the blood component therapy, so 48 percent reduction is a very very dramatic reduction in mortality. Lastly, coming to viscoelastic guided, so eye tactic uh, trial. Uh, did not find any difference when they resuscitated patient using either viscoelastic guided or conventional uh, coagulation test and uh, the meta-analysis which was published last year again said that it might prevent unnecessary use of blood products that's about it uh, I am not sure that there was any benefit in mortality. So what should I do at the bedside? Resuscitate it early, preferably with warm FFP. If possible, literature seems to suggest that uh, fresh whole blood if uh, available to you. And so, for example, you go to Israel and that is the only country where all patients, they do the uh, HIV, HIV status testing and they will collect the blood and transfers to the patient straight away, the military victims because they are constantly uh, being attacked and repelling the aggressors. Uh, aggression will correct hypothermia, prevent further development of hypothermia, correct hypothermia as soon as possible. So cold stored blood, I was also not aware that it's, I, am, I don't think it's available to us in our hospital. Uh, but cold stored blood which is stored at 1 to 6 degrees centigrade uh, or fresh whole, whole blood if possible uh, should be used. If it is not available then FFP that platelet should be used aggressively. If possible uh, FFP that platelet should be given as early as possible. Uh, I am not sure about the NRC association. Essentially, it means giving epidural anesthesia so that the impulses don't reach the brain, which may not be possible always, or may be regional blocks in patients with trauma. You don't have time to do all this in patients with trauma. It can be possible in surgeries. Do not perform corrective surgery, stick to damage control surgery and hope for the patient. Thank you very much.